I just want to look at the, some respiratory illnesses. Respiratory syncytial virus is often a virus that can, you know, rapidly kill children and, and be a very nasty bug. We find that vitamin D also works through the same system in producing cathocidin and then destroying the virus. And can you imagine how much virus there is if you're getting your entire lung epithelial system fighting it? You can kill it off pretty fast. What about TB? Well, Dr. Heaney talked about one of the slides, so I'm going to skip over that, but TB kills a lot of people. Uh, 1.7 million deaths every year from TB, that's not a small number. One third of the population is infected with TB. Uh, remember sanatoriums, where they used to, you know, give you lots of rest and relaxation and, uh, oh, by the way, you should go out in the sun. Uh, Robert Koch discovered the TB, got a Nobel Prize. You know, there's somebody who also got a Nobel Prize here um, for finding streptomycin, but maybe that wasn't a good thing. Yes, it did save a lot of lives, but then we forgot all about adding vitamin D from sunshine. Since then, the sanatoriums have closed and everything has gone back to normal, but we used to use that as a mainstay of therapy. We should reintroduce sunlight and vitamin D. So it was effective, and uh, if you actually use vitamin D, you will upregulate the, the cathelocidin again, and you will get a 50% kill rate on TB. Well, you, you look at that and say, oh, 50%, you know, we have antibiotics that do 97%, you know, how can that be helpful? But in combination with antibiotics, that's how it works. So uh, I'm just, just going to briefly say this is the same study that Dr. Heaney had where they used 10,000 international units of vitamin D, which is what you would get in sunlight or a sanatorium. They had 100% of the people recover with the antibiotics and the vitamin D. They also did a study just to see if one dose of 10,000 international units of vitamin D would make a difference. And they studied the cells that were responding to the TB and they found, yes, an absolutely amazing response that these cells have against uh, TB. A study using 100,000 international units three times during the year did not have the same effect as if you used it 10,000 international units every day. If you really think of it, 100,000 three times a year is really only 1,000 international units a day. And even this, this guy in the study says, that's probably why it didn't work. We also find that respiratory infections are much less. 11-fold reduction if you have better vitamin D. Wow. This is that, a study looking at the flu. Uh, they did a study for two years. The first year they used 800 international units. And the second year they used 2,000 international units. In the first year you did have some uh, cases of the flu. The second year, he only had one case of the flu, and it was in the summertime, not in the winter. This is the same study from Dr. Heaney. You know, 42% reduction in, um, in the flu. And asthma attacks were significantly reduced. Actually, they had a 60%, this was a secondary endpoint. They found a 60% reduction in um, asthma attacks in those school children. We often find that the viral infections are what triggers the asthma in these kids. So if we can prevent the infection and also help them not to get the asthma, that's wonderful. We should be doing this. How much vitamin D do you need to protect you from influenza? Well, there's a good study here that shows if you have less than 95 nanomoles per liter, you double your risk of having influenza. What about hepatitis and, and vitamin D? Interesting. There's a study that was done looking at getting levels greater than 80 nanomoles in these people. And when you added the vitamin D, you got a 96% response. 96 of the people got better rather than the 40 to 50% that you see normally with uh, the hepatitis standard of care treatment. Isn't that amazing? You know, a double, you know, you get almost a 100% response rate with the vitamin D. The other thing is, I have used this in some of my patients not knowing about this study, because I've been using vitamin D for a while in my, in my practice. 
And I've had people who have had hepatitis C, one for their treatment, and they're going, oh, you might get quite depressed from, you know, the treatment, which is a common side effect. None of my patients have ever become depressed. They, said they went through it with, and they all responded. It's wonderful. What about H. pylori? It's a bad bug. 29% of people in the world are infected with H. pylori. It increases your risk of stomach cancer. Will you find stomach cancer early? Not in your life. It's be one of the last things you'll find. You know, it's late in life that you say, well, I've had indigestion for 10 years, and now it's getting worse, and you look and they've got stomach cancer. Well, one of the things that does increase your risk significantly is H. pylori. If you get enough vitamin D, well, it reduces your risk by 50%. It's a small study, but it's significant. This was followed for 20 years. It was using a vitamin D analog, by the way. I think vitamin D itself might be better. When you look at Crohn's disease, people who have this NOD2 gene, what happens is if you only got one or two copies of the gene, you are very prone to get infections and get all kinds of problems with Crohn's. Normal people have more than four of these copies of the genes and they're not likely to get the infection. They have found that if you add vitamin D, you get, a, you get an improvement that those two genes then get stimulated and you're able to uh, recover better and have less problems with Crohn's disease. What about atopic eczema? Well, atopic eczema, those people are quite prone to infections in the skin and we do find that the levels of uh, cathelicidin are very low. That's contrasted to psoriasis. Psoriasis is also a very bad inflammatory problem with your skin. But rarely do we get infections of the skin with psoriasis. Their cathelicidin level is huge, it's very high. Whereas with uh, atopic eczema, it's low, and you need to boost the cathelicidin. And they found that you can increase your cathelicidin by 600% in this particular study and get rid of the infections, prevent the infections. What about wound healing? Same thing happens. When you wound yourself, the first thing that happens is vitamin D goes in there, stimulates the cathelicidin, and then you get repair or re-epithelialization, as we would call it. Or, and you also fight off the infection that's coming in the wound. You need it for both things. And it's very high, the cathelicidin level, during the first 48 hours. You're dead in the water if you don't have enough vitamin D. And you will be more prone to infections. What about post-operative complications? This is a really interesting study that just recently came out. They used two arms. One was to intensive physiotherapy to prevent people from falling and having fractures. And the second intervention was 2,000 international units of vitamin D. They found with the physiotherapy that you would have 60% less falls, and therefore you wouldn't have readmissions to the hospital. With 2,000 international units of vitamin D, you had a 90% reduction in the number of infections you had. Can you imagine what kind of healthcare savings that would incur? I'm going to go on to another area, which is bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis can increase your risk of having um, premature deliveries and also chorionitis, all, all nasty things that can you know, result in a delivery that doesn't have a good outcome. If your vitamin D level is highest in these studies, they found that you would have up to four times less problems with your uh, infections from bacterial vaginosis. That's significant. What about preeclampsia? If you had low levels of vitamin D, this is a level at 27, 37 nanomoles. If it was lower than that, you'd double your risk of having preeclampsia. If you have a it also doubles your risk of having a cesarean section. Wow, maybe that's because the muscles aren't working right and you can't contract them properly and get, can't get that baby out. What about diabetes? Same thing happens. There's good studies and I could spend about a, a three quarters of an hour just talking about diabetes. What about prenatal existence? Well, you know, our Canadians are smart again. They use uh, 2,000, they suggest 2,000 international units of vitamin D for all pregnant women. Are we following those suggestions? Not everybody is. Uh, and a lot of physicians that I've talked to aren't even aware that we should be using at least that in pregnancy. We talk about pregnancy and breastfeeding. Well, you need four to five times as much vitamin D. 
When you look at breastfeeding, 4,000 international units will improve the vitamin D levels of both the mother and the infant, and some are suggesting even as high as 6,000 in a newer study that just came out. What about rickets? Well, we know rickets is a problem in Canada. There's been several papers on rickets in the last few years. It still exists. It's still around. We still see people with this. And in Edmonton, remember the study where we showed that the 19-year-olds had the lowest levels of vitamin D? That's terrible. They should be the ones with the highest. But we just think of vitamin D and osteoporosis. So we use it at the end of the lifespan. We need to use it at the beginning. So there are other uh, recommendations by the Pediatric Society. Um, they are also a little bit higher than what the IOM report suggests. Uh, they suggest 800 to 1,200 international units for kids, you know, over the age one. And if you look at the American studies, they increased it to 400 international units a couple of years ago when they thought, well, and the title of, title of the talk is, is right, you know, preventing rickets. It doesn't do much else. It doesn't help all the other things that vitamin D does for you. We talked about vitamin D in falls. Uh, Dr. Heaney did at least. There is no benefit with 200, 400, or 600 international units of vitamin D. But once you get to 800 international units, one of these studies showed a 72% reduction in falls. That's huge. Back pain. Well, this is my favorite area because I did an article on that. Um, I see people all the time with back pain. Well, a lot of it is mechanical and they've got the leg pain with it. Well, they're probably not going to benefit that much from vitamin D. But there's lots of people who have idiopathic back pain, which means it's just, I got back pain. Well, what's the first symptom of osteomalacia? Back pain. Back pain. There's a study that was done in Saudi Arabia where they have low levels of vitamin D in a lot of people too, and they had uh, an amazing response to back pain with those who did not have a neurological problem. Those who had just chronic back pain, they gave them five to 10,000 international units of vitamin D, and 100% of those patients who had back pain actually re had no more back pain once they had normal levels of vitamin D. Dr. Plotnikov, who I had the pleasure of meeting last month, um, he did a study in in the States, 93% of people coming with nonspecific musculoskeletal pain into the emergency department are deficient in vitamin D. No surprise. Another study here done in Europe, I, I read this study and I'm looking at the title and it says asylum seekers. Whoa, what are asylum seekers? Are they crazy people or what? You know, no, asylum seekers are actually emergency visitors in Europe. <laughs> I didn't know that. So treatment of uh, vitamin D, these people used 300,000 international units as an injection to people who had really bad musculoskeletal pain that was of no, they didn't know why they had it. And asked them to use 800 international units of vitamin D every day. Whether they did or not, we don't know. But after three months, they found that the visits were down by 66%. The, uh, you know, that's, you know, that would open up a few emergency spots that we always have trouble, you know, getting into emergency. I don't know about you, but I'm getting older. I have gray hair. I had it since I was 30, so you can't tell how old I am. <laughs> Anyways, um, I really don't want to end up in a nursing home. If you're, you, and there was a study done in using, uh, I think, 12,000 patients. Um, if your level of vitamin D was less than 25, your, your risk of entering a nursing home was four times that if it, unless it was over 75. Three times the risk at 50 nanomoles and uh, even at 75 nanomoles to 50 to 75 nanomoles, it doubled your risk of getting, entering a nursing home in the next six years while you were at home. <laughs>